appearing to live stream, which is fabulous. It's always, uh, you never quite can guarantee it, can you? They always change things and then you're never quite sure, but it does say it's redirecting us to appearing YouTube. To stream, which is so fabulous. there we go. And there it's coming up. So that's fabulous. Hello, everybody. And welcome to our amazing session unfortunately it's the the last one to be talking about launchpad the countdown to publishing your book and um, the the third of three conversations and i've enjoyed all of them so i i hope if this is you joining us for the third time that you found them all instructional and uh also fun as well that they've been informative as well as fun um and we all get to to be part of that um so today we have three new people that we've not met before in these sessions. Um, I'm going to start with um, Grace Salmon at the top, uh, top of my screen, who is, um, we could say she's to blame for all this. She brought this this project <laughs> together and uh, was the, the sort of uh, the brains behind the whole enterprise. And thankfully, she then reached out to Stephanie Larkin, who uh, of Red Penguin Books and who kindly agreed that this would be a great idea um, to put this launchpad series together and we were lucky that Teresa said she would come in and uh, do a chapter about audiobooks and narration which is so I'm really glad we've got this because it's booming it's everywhere we need to be uh, aware of this and Sydney coming in to talk about illustrations and um, which again was a, a real eye opener to me because I, I write purely fiction and I don't have any illustrations, but just learning that novels generally, there is a lot of illustrations involved as well as those kind of more um, instructional books as well. So really interesting for me. And then we've got Bill here as well, who has come in and shared um, really good observations about the difference between working in the traditional publishing space and the indie publishing space and um, what you can learn from both, because, of course, both spaces have value to, to bring. Um, so I, I, I'm really excited about learning more. But I wonder, Teresa, I wonder if we could start with you. Um, because I do know from speaking to people that not everybody has embraced audiobooks. And I don't know if you've come across this, but there's certainly this sort of um, debate around whether if you listen to a book, have you really read the book? <laughs> <laughs> and so yes. if we've got people who have not yet embraced audio um, and are curious about it, I wonder why do you think it's important or why should readers kind of reconsider that if they haven't taken to audio books yet? Yes, I think there's, um, I think that's a very common sort of thread that we're talking about right now. Is this, how, is it real? Is it really reading? And I think, um, I think that just the growing number of people coming to the format in the last even five years, like just if you look at the industry growth, the, um, that's how I start off my chapter actually is talking about some of the, the bare bones numbers of it. It's a really, as you said, booming segment mm -hmm. of um, how people are consuming story. And I think I think that's true of audiobook and podcast. Like I was talking to my father recently, who's a real lover of radio, used to love radio. And he was like, I feel like, I feel like the magic of radio is being sort of reinvented and brought back. And so I, I do think there's I do think it's an authentic way. I personally, as a narrator, think it's an authentic way to take in story. Um, and I think while audiobooks themselves maybe began as this form of accessibility, mm -hmm. right? The Library of Congress had sort of books for the blind, essentially. You know, audiobooks started in that way. And then books on tape were really about, oh, if you're driving in your car for a road trip this summer, plug in this set of tapes you could pick up from the library. And I think, you know, I remember all those phases. And I'm just thrilled today, you know, my children can get online or get on Libby, they can get in an app and mm -hmm. just instantaneously access all of these stories. So I think it's, I think it's about access. Uh, I think it's, it's naive to think for, from a reader or author standpoint that it's not here. It is fully here. There are, it is, yeah. it is a format the you format should be considering. Sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I love audiobooks. Um, I don't know why it took me so long to get to them. And I too think it is a way of reading the book. It's just a different way of reading it. Um, uh, it it's, 
I, and I like that, that your father was saying that about it being a kind of reinvention of the radio as well, because, of course, some books, they are narrated by one person. But then there yes. are others where you have a whole cast of characters and you have um, instrumental in, mixed in with it as well. Yes. So it really is re, it's like theatre, essentially, isn't yes. it? Yes, I think that's all a product of technology. You know, you even even just from a consumer standpoint, not a producer or a creator standpoint, you can see how technology has made things um, easier, faster. And so, and even just me, you know, I'm in a home studio. I don't have to live on the coast of the United States. I don't be, have to be in LA or New York to participate in the creator space of it. And that's largely because of the portability and the sophistication and affordability really of technology. Mm -hmm. And I do think that is, that's influencing how, creators, storytellers are imagining what audio experience they want. And this sort of multicast or dual cast, although I, I love one narrate, I love getting lost in one narrator skills, right? Mm -hmm. When you're, when you're a third of the way through the book and you literally forget that one person is telling you this story because they capture each character so richly, right? Um, but I also am sincerely enjoying the multicast and the sort of like you're saying kind of back to live theater or uh, radio production value with all kinds of sound incorporated I think it's just um I think we're really thinking about this intimate form of storytelling right it's just right it's right in your ear it's really very intimate experience to take yeah. in a story that way that's such a great word to use, intimate. Um, it does reflect it so, so well, especially yeah. if you listen to books at night. You know, if you're in the middle of the night, and you can't get to sleep and you switch on an audio book. It sort of cocoons you in this lovely uh, in this lovely experience. And it's something that interested me recently. My daughter uh, was looking for a new audio book and we found one and she loved the story. And we tried to find the paperback so that she could read it. And there was no paperback. And I discovered yeah. that some publishers are looking for audio first books, which was really interesting. Yes. And I thought, ah, OK, this is a new step, something else that we're we're kind yes. of evolving into. So yes, I, I think, think it's that powerful. I also think just as one more side, I know I'm taking up I'm talking too much, probably. Um, I would love to say that I also think it's genre encompassing. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I've I've recently been listening to short story compilations where you have multiple narrators, but it's this. Uh, it's a great like way to take in short story. It's also this brilliant way of taking in nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. Like I, I liken it sort of to Ken Burns. Like I was a huge, I've been a huge fan of the PBS series with Ken Burns. And I kind of feel like the narration quality that's happening in some of these nonfictions. I was listening to one by Shelby Foote on the Silver War. And it's, you know, it's a commitment. It's many, many years with one narrator. Mm -hmm. Grover Gardner is actually the narrator on it. One of the golden voices. And he, but I think it's a great way to take in information, whether you're a lifelong learner in, in your 50s or you're in your 20s in college or you're in middle school, that you, that this access to audio as a as entertainment and education is is in a growth phase, I think. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm a big fan of the the great courses plus. I listen to a lot of those. Yes. And is, yes. is anybody else on the panel here? I, you... I just wanted to add, you know, Teresa, you mentioned how you mentioned how intimate it is, but yes. I almost had the opposite experience that I wanted. It was so exciting. Uh, we were recently in Hawaii on a trip and listened to an audio book about the birth of Hawaii and the Hawaiian gods and the whole. And as opposed to intimate, it was shared, which was so cool. We played it oh. in the car the whole family while we drove around the islands. So we listened and now we all got to talk about it. We all know about what happened to King Kamehameha and Mal and it was very exciting. It was like, it was like I got to read a novel, but at the same time as five collectively, other collectively reading. Yes. That's a very, that's a really cool uh, experience. Very cool. I love that. I and love and that. I'm already looking forward to it taking another oh. road trip with my yeah. husband and thinking I'm going to pick a book so we yes. could experience it together and together. talk about it together and it enriches the whole trip. Yeah, I exactly. love that. Well, I think it gets us back in many ways to our roots of why do we tell stories? You know, stories were oral stories to begin with. 
And, uh, you know, yes, we had cave paintings, which would be you know, <laughs> right up Sydney's alley of uh, uh, <laughs> illustration. But there is something magical about being read too. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is also one of the reasons uh, not only accessibility, as Teresa points out, but, you know, as Stephanie points out, it's a way of sharing. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I love that it is um, becoming more and more in the fore. And if you ever have a chance to listen to any of Teresa's books, they are stunning. <laughs> Thank you. Well, so for our, our writers who are, are watching this right now and they're thinking, I would love to um, have a narration made of my book, what would be a sort of good starting point for someone, Teresa? What would you recommend that they, just to get them off the ground and up and running? Well, I think, the large marketplace, if you want to think of like the Walmart of, of accessibility to connecting authors and narrators is something called ACX. And the other one in the marketplace is Find Away Voices. And those two marketplaces uh, are, I just, there's probably thousands. I'm not even sure how many narrators participate, but narrators put their samples in, authors put their stories in, and, and auditions happen. And I think I've talked to some authors who got hundreds of auditions when they uploaded a book. So I think it's, that's those two places. One is owned by Audible, one is owned by Spotify. Those are the behemoths in the marketplace. But you can also Google audiobook producers, um, audiobook publishing houses, and come up with these smaller boutique places, if that's kind of more your jam. Um, uh, the ones I've worked with have been Pink Flamingo and Lyric Audiobooks, uh, Northern Lake Audio, but there there are, I mentioned some of them in my chapter, actually, um, and we hear from some of the, like the founder of Lyric Audiobooks is one of the people that I talk to as sort of an audiobook expert for my chapter. So yeah, I think you have to kind of start in the marketplace. Where do you meet a narrator? You could also, though, you could say, oh, I loved listening to this particular audiobook, and Google that narrator, reach out directly to that narrator. We're all actually really approachable. And I think it's been my experience just in three or four years in this industry that um, that most narrators have a website. The, there's a, you could Google a name and find a person and just reach out, say, who are you? How could I work with you? What is your process like? Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. I love that. Yeah. Thank you. Yay. Sure. Um, <laughs> If we have time, I would love to come back and chat to you a little bit about AI, because I know that that is um, ever growing, ever, ever growing. And we we can't escape it as authors. Um, but I'll, I'll, I will move on. But if we have time, <laughs> I'd love to come back to you about okay. that. Um, Sydney, welcome. So nice to meet you. Likewise. Um, <laughs> I, so tell us, uh, one of the things that you talked about in your chapter were NFTs. And um, I'm not sure if this, I, this was new to me, I'd sort of heard the phrase around, but I wonder if you could just help us understand a little bit more about what NFTs are. Okay, yeah, absolutely. It's actually something that Stephanie suggested that I include in the chapter. And initially, I it hadn't even occurred to me to write about it. But as soon as she mentioned it, I was like, you know what, uh, everybody in my life, to some degree, you know, as an artist, everybody's been coming up to me and just kind of asking my opinion on it. So as soon as Stephanie mentioned it, it kind of like rang true, like, oh, you know what? Yeah, everybody really is wondering about this. Um, so yeah, so I guess I'll, I'll break it down for those who haven't read the chapter or anything yet. Basic, so NFT stands for non-fungible token. And so all that means is, you know, it can't be exchanged, you know, there's no like identical kind of thing that, would really equate to it um so i i'm trying to, so it's it's tough for me because i'm not a particularly tech savvy person it took uh, a lot of the more tech people in my life to even make it make sense to me um so basically what it is is it can be a work of art you know that's very very popular um but it could just be something that almost resembles like like a Chuck E. Cheese to token, if you think about something like that. But some kind of digital representation of something um, that is encrypted and is usually also connected to some kind of cryptocurrency, usually Bitcoin, um, eth Ethereum, often called Ether, is another very popular uh, cryptocurrency that usually has a value assigned to this token. Um, so honestly, the easiest way for me to sort of make it make sense to other people is it's very much the equivalent of buying an original painting because there's no 
identical replica of it, really. Um, you know, whereas opposed to, you know, if you're buying a print of an artwork, there's a bajillion of them, you know, the, the value, you know, goes down the more that you print off of them. But with, uh, with an NFT, there's just the one singular thing. Um, and depending on the artist uh, who makes it, whether it belongs to a, a collection or not, um, that can determine the value. It's very, very trend-based. It's a very volatile ma market because it is so heavily trend-based. Mm -hmm. And because it is attached to something as you know controversial as cryptocurrency. Um, so I have had people ask me, and the reason, actually, I think probably the reason Stephanie asked me to, to write about this is because I've had authors talk to me about whether an NFT situation would be ideal for marketing purposes. And unfortunately, I've had to be the sort of bearer of bad news and say, I personally don't see it being anything that you can rely on. Um, it, if you know how to tap into that market um, and you're very, very devoted to it, um, as I know some people actually, there's a good friend of mine who spends literally I, hours on, a, you know, a day on Twitter trying to sort of follow all the, the crypto people and, and really just get immersed in that and see what where the market's at for it, what trends are getting popular. It's not something that you can just sort of advertise a book with, with simply an Instagram post. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something that you're you're looking for very big fish in a huge, huge pond and who are very, very shy about, you know, where they want to invest their their money. So it's not mm -hmm. something I typically recommend, but it it is something that comes up quite a bit. And, and so is this a way that you share your your illustrations with writers that it's done through an NFT or is that not yet uh, where we're not? Not yet. I'm wondering if that is where it's going to be going. Um, as of right now, it seems like the it's kind of cooling off. It was, as I'm sure you're, you're familiar, especially during the pandemic, it was, they, they were everywhere. Everybody was talking about them. Nobody really knew what they were, but they were all talking about them. I think right now, just especially with, uh, you know, the economy in general sort of being sort of iffy here and there uh, in the, over the past couple of years, especially coming out of the pandemic, things have been a little bit unstable. I think the sort of uh, Silicon Valley, the real, those, those types who are, you know, very invested in the NFT market, I think they're going to have to adapt to mm -hmm. make it something a little bit more accessible. Otherwise I, I do see it completely fizzling out. Um, I'd like to see it. Because yeah. quite often there's a technology that comes, but it's not until the sort of second or third iteration of that technology exactly. that really takes off. So exactly. you're in at the ground level, kind of understanding even what yeah. it is. <laughs> yeah. So I, I personally haven't dabbled yet. Like I said, I've had authors ask me about it, mostly as a marketing tool, which I see that being much more effective than just a way of putting illustrations out there. Because again, you're only able to sort of, you're only able to sell one at a time. Like, again, it's like an original painting mm -hmm. and because they're, in, you know, specifically encrypted, you know, I couldn't make the exact same one again and sell it to the same person. Otherwise it inherently loses its value. Yeah. Um, so I don't particularly see that yeah, moment again, unless it <laughs> adapts, um, it would definitely be a more effective marketing strategy. I actually, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar. I don't know if there are any East coast people who are familiar with uh, Wawa. They're like a gas station food thing akin to sheets that kind of thing they actually for they just ran a marketing campaign where they were you know doing a sweepstakes and giving away nfts um to people who entered the sweepstakes so i i think as more people and more companies start picking up on that i see it becoming a much more effective marketing strategy but I definitely don't want any authors to be going into it right now thinking, you know, that this is the sort of jackpot or this is how I can get, you know, illustrations out there. Um, but I think it's something that we should all be <clears throat> keeping a close eye on. That's for sure. Hey. Oh, well, thank you for that. That's given us at least very least an introduction to it. And for people like me who didn't even know what it was, I feel <laughs> better educated already. <laughs> well, it's true that some people make millions you know we we had an incident i guess it was about a year ago sydney that um our former president released uh, a collection of nfts and and made like a billion dollars overnight in nfts and then everybody wants to i want to get on the bandwagon and 
Um, you know, it's like Bitcoin. There are people who, right. you know, discovered they had Bitcoin on their computer and all of a sudden it became a meme. Um, and and like, it, like you said, it could burn out. It does often need various iterations before it goes. But uh, I, I was glad to talk to Sydney about it because I felt like every single day some author was asking me, so when we market the book, how many NFTs are we going to release? And I'm like, I don't even know what that means, but we'll go there. Um, and that and that would be going for children's books as well as um, poetry books are huge on illustration and NFT right now. Um, many novels, um, we do a lot of illustrated novels, not just, um, you know, graphic novels, but people who want to have whether it's just a logo or maps or uh, characterizations or whatever might go with it. So it seems like every day someone's asking the NFT question, just like you said, Emma, every day someone's asking the AI question also. It's and that goes for uh, audio books as well as written books. I get the AI question every mm -hmm. single day. So yeah, yeah. And, and that goes for art very easily. Art as is well. AI, AI also. question is, oh my gosh, I can't get away from it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was at a conference last week and it, it absolutely came up at that conference as well but yes. let's, let's let's kind of get back to illustrations and 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 your job and your role as an illustrator for for authors because one of the things that came out for me in your chapter was the real emphasis that an author and an illustrator working together is very very much a partnership um and I wonder, is that how you see it, too, as the illustrator, that this is you're not just being hired to um, create some images for a book, but actually you're working in collaboration with an author to make sure that you both can that, that one enhances the other. Absolutely. And honestly, it's a part I, I absolutely see it as a partnership and a collab uh, collaboration just from start to finish. But I also it's something that I don't take lightly um, because partly because it's so rare to see you really only see that in this sort of self-publishing indie publishing or hybrid publishing markets when you're working with the you know more traditional publishing the author and the illustrator never even really get to interact ever a lot of times actually the author doesn't even know who their illustrator is going to be until the book is virtually published yeah. so for me the experiences that i've had working with authors it's, it's something, again, I, I don't take it lightly at all. I actually see it as quite a privilege um, because it's the one chance that, you know, I can actually help somebody achieve a very complete vision, a very unique vision. Um, it's something that, you know, again, if you start, if you go from start to finish, I mean, they're, you're showing hundreds of, you know, dozens to hundreds of sketches. And then before we even get into, you know, whether it's going to be watercolor, whether it's going to be, you know, how much of it's going to be black and white versus, uh, you know, full color, whether they want it, you know, digitally uh, illustrated versus traditional media. I mean, there are just so many questions and different paths to navigate there. Um, and every single decision you make is going to have some kind of impact on, you know, you have because you have to think about well, the demographic for the book too, whether it's for, you know, the toddler age, whether it's for slightly older children, like eight, nine, 10 year olds, that's going to be a completely different visual style that you're going to have to cater. Um, and then again, while also balancing on whether or not that author has a vision, you know, I've had some authors who have had very, very specific visions. Mm -hmm. um, and you and I've had authors that have absolutely no vision whatsoever. They've never even thought about what, you know, X character would look like versus, you know, the mom character versus, you know, the pets, you know. So um, it's a very interesting little dance that you get to do together. I actually, I think dancing is actually quite an, uh, an interesting metaphor for it because uh, you don't, it's, I'm trying to think of the best way to, to put it you have to sort of navigate who who's leading and when you know whose vision is taking over when because the artist also has to have some degree of of freedom it's not necessarily all about I, as much as I love my authors you know a lot of them don't again a lot of them don't know um you know whether or not they even have a proper vision for it so mm -hmm. there's going to be times where they're going to want to like relinquish the reins a little bit and there are going to be times where I'm going to have to let them tell me what they want mm -hmm. um so it's I don't want to call it a power dynamic so I kind of like I, I like the idea of dancing a little bit more because it's it's much more of a reciprocal more fluid. yeah yeah more fluid. yeah 
Yay. I have I to, I that, have to chime in. I have to chime in. I'm sorry. That is so, that's a, such a great parallel to audiobooks and the relationship that the narrator and the author have, like what you're describing. And that, if I can like just jump a little tiny bit into AI is my problem with AI, because I just think the author's voice is what the narrator is, the author's intent and voice is what the narrator is trying to build upon. And that relationship, I just can't imagine an artificial intelligence reaching that level I that that would surprise me and because that sort of collaboration is so intense um you know even in my audio you can hear it when I smile <laughs> and how would a computer ever how would AI ever do that I don't know so yeah sorry to interrupt but I think that's such well, a that, great, not, that relationship between artists is exactly how I feel about narration as well mm -hmm. for audiobooks Mm -hmm. And I imagine, too, that there are authors who um, don't know exactly what, how they want their uh, voice to sound, the narrator to sound, much as yes. they're not entirely sure of what they want the illustrations to look like. Same. But it's so nuanced, and it takes yes. an expert to come in and offer some guidance to say, well, it could be this way, it could be that way. What do you resonate with most? It's Sydney, do you know, I when I speak to um, particularly children's book writers, they're always gobsmacked when they discover that if they go traditional, they don't get a say in who their illustrator is. And often the ones I've spoken to, they're fine trying to look for an illustrator themselves because they feel they should be going with the illustrations ready for the publisher. And it's quite a shock to them when they discover that's not the way it works. Right. Yeah. Yes. And I actually, it's funny uh, that you mentioned that. I was actually just working on a, a project uh, with some, actually some professors from my alma mater, which is really lovely. Um, but they were getting a book together and we wound up doing what's uh, what's called a comp. Um, uh, it could also be called, I think I've also heard it called like a, like a dummy. And, you know, it, it, in essence, it's basically like sort of a, like a manuscript, like almost like a draft of the manuscript, but it's a small selection and it does have some illustrations in it. Very, usually very basic ones. Um, and so far uh, I haven't heard from them as far as their journey yet, but they are, they're very set on trying to preserve, you know, keep me on as, as their illustrator, but you know, it, there's no guarantee and, you know, they were, you know, the whole thing was uh, very tentative. You know, they're like, how many illustrations do we do? You know, is it even, you know, for a while, there were times where we were even debating whether it was worth doing. Um, I was very happy to have them believe in me and we'll see, hopefully we'll see if it, if it takes off. I'd, I'd love it to, because it's a beautiful book and I believe in it very strongly. But uh, yeah, so you, it's definitely not for the faint of heart if you want to try to pursue that route. I know some, there then they had said that, they had worked at some publishing houses that, you know, when they did send in their their, their comp or their dummy, whatever you'd like to call it, um, you know, the publisher did wind up being very pleased with the illustrations and, and thankfully kept them on. But yeah, I, it's like I said, that's why I, I really do see it as, as a privilege to get to work directly with authors because I, it's just, I, I just can't imagine how I would feel, you know, for if it were my work, because, you know, I'm sure being an author is very much like being an artist and that you're putting your whole heart, your whole soul and everything into what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You create this beautiful work. And then next thing you know, it's in somebody else's hands and you have no control, no power over it anymore. So <laughs> being, be, <laughs> yes, being able to, being able to sort of help, you know, keep the, keep the power in the author's hands a little bit more. Yeah, It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing to see, especially when it when it's done, you know, they, the way that their face just lights up. Like, uh, I remember the first book I worked on with Stephanie, actually, um, when we finally landed on the character design for the main character is this, this little ladybug girl. I just remember uh, the the author just, oh, my gosh, her expression was just unparalleled. It was it was such a beautiful thing. She's like, that's her, you know, just having that kind of a having that kind of a moment with somebody. And I'm sure Teresa can relate, you know, when you find the right narrator for for the book, you know, it's like, yes, that that's it. You know, just that <laughs> light bulb moment is just it's a wonderful thing to have. Yeah. And it's great. I And it's so good that you've pointed that out, that being able to work with the indie author or the hybrid author just allows that collaboration. Because, Bill, you you've worked in both um, the traditional space and the indie space. and um, in your chapter, you share kind of a lot of the experiences you've had working in both of those spheres. Um, we were talking about the sort of control, perhaps, that they, the traditional author, ha the traditional publisher has. Have you found that to be the ex your experience when, when it comes to, to the written word as well? 
Yes, absolutely. No question. And I, I have to say I was smiling when Sydney was talking because um, in the chapter that I that I wrote for Launchpad, um, I, I detail, I think it's 10 uh, items that, uh, you know, authors should be aware of if they're going the self-publishing route. And the very first one is focus on the cover art. And <laughs> so for me, um, it was it was a wonderful experience on the other side of what Sydney was just talking about. I was that author who was so, so overjoyed with the work that the artist did. But I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. I, I should probably just give context. And that is that um, I've published two books and um, I'll shamelessly hold each one up. But the first one was, uh, they're very different in many ways. I mean, this one's hardcover, this one's softcover, uh, but uh, fiction and nonfiction. So this is nonfiction. And this was published traditionally about 10 years ago by Harper Collins, by a you know, major publisher. And um, you know everything was done by the book. I had a, an agent and he sold it, uh, thankfully, very, very quickly to HarperCollins. And then, uh, you know, it became a, a media tour. As the cover implies, it is um, sort of an expose on the airline industry in the United States, particularly on safety issues. Um, and uh, the airlines are acting up and misbehaving again this week. So I'm, so I'm <laughs> I, I worked this this broadcast around three media interviews that I'm doing today, telling the airlines to uh, clean up their act. So that's my, you know, that's my sort of day job. And, um, you know, it's funny when, when Sydney was just talking, it occurred to me, I never met the artist that did this cover. We never even spoke on the phone. I think we had some email exchanges and I was given three choices. And I thought, you know, and others that I solicited opinions from agreed this was the best one. Someone, a very cynical friend of mine said to me later, you know, they gave you two bad ones. They knew which one they wanted. They knew you'd pick, you know, and I said, well, I, I can't uh, speak to that. But um, but then my other book, um, which is uh, very much a labor of love, uh, is a novel and it's called Half the Child. And um, I'm gonna hold the cover up as, as close as I can. Um, you can probably figure out what's going on there. Um, this is a novel that chronicles a very painful custody and uh, and parental abduction story. And I don't have the artistic ability to, to draw a triangle, but I was sitting in traffic uh, when I lived in Connecticut. And I-95, by the way, in Connecticut is um, officially the busiest stretch of traffic in the United States. Everyone in Los Angeles, I know you're going to say no, but it is. And so I was sitting in bump of bump, bump, bumper to bumper traffic in Connecticut uh, about five years ago, and I was sitting behind a little minivan with those stickers that you see there of little families of moms and dads and dogs and cats and babies. And I was, you know, staring at this for a half hour and it occurred to me, well, what happens uh, if this uh, happy family splits up, you know? So that is why this child is, uh, you know, half the child uh, re recalling the, uh, the biblical passage of uh, King David, excuse me, King Solomon uh, taking an, a sword and cutting the child in half. And so um, I sketched it out. And when I say it's crude, trust me, it was crude. I sketched it out on a, on a post-it note. And I knew this is what I wanted, like half, you know, half of a child with a, with a mother figure and a father figure on the back of, you know, two identical cars. And um, a friend put me in touch with Eric Costin, a wonderful, wonderful artist. And uh, I can't tell you the feeling of my crude sketch, which was only up here. Only I knew what I wanted. And there it is. This is exactly what I wanted. Not sort of, not like, yeah, he, he kind of got it. No, this is exactly what in my mind's eye I envisioned sitting in traffic that day. And to have that, you know, now I'm holding it in my hands. Wow, what a great feeling. But, you know, again, speaking to the larger issues of contrasting my experiences, um, you know, between uh, self-publishing and, and traditional publishing, Again, the very first thing, focus on the cover art. I mean, why would we have that expression, judging a book by its cover, unless it was that important, right? I mean, uh, we all do. <laughs> yeah, how, absolutely. We how, can you, how can you underestimate the power of a cover, right? I mean, and so, uh, you know, luckily my journey happened in, in the order it did. I couldn't imagine trying to self-publish if I hadn't been traditionally published. Because for me, basically, I had, you know, an entire team uh, between my agent and, uh, you know, the team at HarperCollins. Um, and I was very lucky because um, in the summer that it came out, um, we had, uh, I, I think I detailed this in, in the chapter, and we had a call where everyone that was having a, a book published in June of that year 
was on a Zoom with, uh, with HarperCollins. And one of their marketing people said to us, we had nothing in common. It was everything from a cookbook author to a novelist to me writing about airline safety and you, know, you name it, children's books. We had nothing in common other than HarperCollins was publishing us that month. And, uh, and, and the late General Colin Powell was, was also one of them. And um, we were told basically, I'm, I'm putting it as much as I can, you sort of run your own when it comes to promotion and publicity. Um, good luck, you know. And there were some older authors who had been publishing for many years on the call. One, in fact, hung up and said, well, that's not how it's been in years past, you know. And it's like, well, that's how it is now, you know. And so I expected the worst. So I went out and I started making plans to do my own promotion and publicity in addition to being a novelist and other things that I do, as, as Stephanie well knows. Um, you know, I'm also I've been a journalist. So I, you know, started preparing. And then luckily, the June, I said it was released in June, and it's June now. And guess what? The airlines are misbehaving as they always do <laughs> as the summer starts, right? And the thunderstorms start. So um, <clears throat> guess what? Colin Powell and I were the two that had uh, a full-time publicist assigned to us, right? So I went off on this media tour for attention all passengers and, you know, like 200 media appearances, and CNN twice and Fox and NPR and all of that, a full hour on fresh air, you know, all of that. Mm -hmm. And so that was great. Yeah, because that was one of the, the surprise me, actually, one of your top tens in the chapter for authors was to invest in PR. And it sort of mm -hmm. surprised me that that was there. Um, obviously, a lovely at HarperCollins that they, they gave you that person. When you transitioned over to the indie space, was that still something that you knew, okay, um, this is a person I need to have on my team, and you you made that investment? Because I think a lot of indies are probably quite scared of the idea of having a PR person. Yes. What yes. have you found to be the benefits of that? Uh, no question. Uh, once I made the decision, and 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 it was a you know a long thought out decision that that half the child was going to be self published. Once I made that decision, I knew and and look, I mean to be very honest, the pockets are not that deep, but I knew I had to make a financial investment, and I basically said I'm either going to do it right or I'm not going to do it at all, you know. And so I, you know, and I detail this in the chapter. I put money aside. I mean, you know, for the cover art, for the, you know, for the design and the layout. I mean, look, you can publish a book very cheaply. You can publish a book tonight if you wanted to. Is that what you want to do? Is that what you want to have out there? And the last thing I wanted was for somebody to pick up half the child and say, oh, this looks self-published. I mean, I would argue, obviously I'm biased, but I would argue nobody would pick up this book and think like, well, this was done in someone's garage, right? I mean, so, um, and the audio version, well, I got um, a really talented guy. His name escapes me. Uh, oh, <laughs> Kieran, that's why Stephanie's laughing. Kieran Larkin. Um, and he did the audio version. And um, I'm from Queens, uh, the borough of Queens in New York, if my accent doesn't betray it. And so is the fictional narrator of Half the Child. And um, and Kieran, you know, brought that, uh, that Queen's touch to it. Um, but yes, so, it, you know, in looking at it, I, I put money aside for the cover art, for the publicity, for a book party, for all the things that HarperCollins largely did for me. I said, OK, well, what worked and what didn't? And most of it worked. And so um, publicity is something that probably a lot of uh, a lot of authors don't think about, um, but it's critical. And. I mean, you know, this is the age where everybody is their own gas station attendant and their own travel agent and their own grocery, you know, checker. But, you know, when you when you're your own publicist, that's a bad formula. I can tell you, I have I have so what, do, what does a, what does a publicist do? How you know, what did they do? Sure. To help you get your a, the best one sentence summary I can give you is a publicist is speaking about your book in third person rather than first person. And that sounds a lot better on everyone's ears. OK. I mean, how was I supposed to look? I I I could do some publicity. I did. I I was once a communications uh, officer in the Air Force Auxiliary. I've I've done some media outreach and and been on the other side as a journalist. But can I pick up a phone and and talk to you know a book a book editor and say you know who's a really good author William J McGee. You know what's a really good book? Half the child. You got to check this guy out, right? Yeah. Now I I know two people who cheated a little bit. They're a married couple. And um, they act as each other's publicists, right? So they're sitting five feet apart from each other. And um, sometimes if they're bored, they put on accents, you know, and, uh, you know, they'll pretend they're from, they're from Ireland or something. And they'll say, you know, 
oh, have I got a great book for you, you know, uh, you have to check her out. No, you have to check this guy out, you know. Um, so and what yeah. Bill's saying, I'm just going to pop in there for a minute yeah. too. And what Bill's saying is so important. And that's why we have the whole third book on marketing. We talk about, you know, what does it mean to have the PR people there? What does it mean to shamelessly self-publish? And how do we as authors in this day and age um, own that marketing piece? So that hopefully, Emma, will be another uh, show that we can consider down the road now that the book is um, just launching. And uh, yeah, the publishing part is the piece that so many of us as authors shy away from, but are so, so important. You know, the reason we wanted to do this publishing book was specifically because there are so many paths to publishing now. As Bill says, you could publish a book tomorrow. Um, I've been playing with AI over the weekend. I'm frightened to think I might have a book written by tomorrow if I wanted one, um, uh, if I could wrestle my head around some of that. But the publishing one is another piece that is such a hard highway to navigate for so many authors. Mm -hmm. uh, part, sometimes time is a factor. You know, I'm an older author, even though um, this series is book number seven for me. Uh, my first book came out 20 years ago. Uh, but then I wrote a novel three years ago, and it was a totally different landscape, traditionally published on the one hand, self-published in others, hybrid published. So we wanted to put in people's hands all of the options. And I can't remember exactly who um, said it within the publishing book, but that not every book will find its own path through the same hands. As, as Bill described, you know, I, and as my own experiences, <clears throat> I'm self-published, I'm indie published, I'm hybrid published. I think it depends on so many factors with the author. Grace, I'm so glad you mentioned that, that there's um, lots of different paths and that the same person can pick different paths for different books. You know, I, I loved that Bill was going to talk about, you know, what he learned now that he's self-published from traditional publishing. The flip side also holds true. People who are self-published and kind of take that um I want to have some say so, like Sydney was saying, they don't get say so, and they take it to this space. And, and knowing what those spaces each have is only going to help people to be more informed about what choice is best for them and for that particular book. There's no one path when people say, well, what's better? There is no better. Yeah. There really is no better. Something might be better for this book, or this author at this time in this space. But publishing is, is such a movable target. Uh, when, when Grace first came to me with these three books, the, the writing, publishing, and marketing, we kind of teased that the marketing book would be the first one that has to go through a revision. The, the book is just being launched now. It's absolutely going to have to be revised. The publishing book will be the second one to be revised because uh, publishing is different. The chapter that I wrote for this book, I think that if I wrote it today might be slightly different than what I wrote just a few short months ago. And certainly six months from now, it would be a totally different chapter because the world keeps changing. So Bill, I love that you uh, are juxtaposing the two. And what's interesting is not, not only are um, people who are self-published learning or indie published learning from the traditional publisher, but every single traditional publishing house today has created often dozens of self-publishing imprints so that HarperCollins actually likes what they are learning from indies and they are in that space as well. So there's, there's so much blur, even the word hybrid publishing came out from being a hybrid between the two major pillars, but everything is gray area nowadays. So, so yeah. the, the, the 10 things I learned is kind of like, here's what we need to all embrace because both sides are learning from each other. And Grace, I'm so excited that you've been on, you've been on every kind of a way now. <laughs> <laughs> Not an audio book yet. Yeah. But, well, here we yeah. go. I see Teresa's right there and she <laughs> <laughs> it is indeed. Uh, and I think that, you know, what Stephanie and I found was, uh, and this, this surprised me. I don't think it surprised Stephanie at all. Uh, the hardest of the three books to write 
was the publishing book because everybody does have their own perspective. And even though, as Stephanie so wisely points out, you have a HarperCollins that now has a more hybrid or self-publishing arm, everybody has their own stance of, you know, if you pay somebody, you're, you're, it's not real publishing, or if you have to pay for certain services. And it was very interesting to have to watch the language of each of the contributors. Uh, to make sure that we were inclusive and that there wasn't a one right way or a one path. And uh, it, it was a fascinating, this, this book I think was the most interesting to get out the door for me because my learning curve on publishing was so huge. I think that people are very, very wedded to what they do. And that was one thing I loved about Bill being um, open to discussing, I've been both ways. They both had their good points and bad points because too many of us uh, sit in one camp or another and think we are the only way. Grace, you are one of the few exceptions also that I know has has done it. You know, three different ways, shall we say? And uh, and you're and you're fine with that. But a lot of people think that their way is the only way, and that's one of the reasons we wanted to do the book is to show that. You know, there's there's more than one way to get to the top of the mountain, shall we say, just like uh, the writing book uh, that Emma had spearheaded with you also showed there are, as they say in novels, plotters and pantsers. And there are and there's good reasons to have both of them. You don't have to be in one camp or another. So I love that all of us kind of go from a different approach, because really the reason for the book was to empower people to be able to say, hey, you wrote something. We we want you to get that baby published. There's a lot of ways to do it. Please don't let anybody tell you there's only one way. Yeah. There's lots of and ways. And something else that you mentioned, I think, which is really important, is that it's not kind of, you don't just have to choose indie or traditional or hybrid, but actually it's a pair of book choice that you can make as yes. well so some books you might want to do one route and some books you might want to do another and that's something that's only sort of become kind of in my zeitgeist I'd say just this year that the flexibility that we have um the the freedom that we have to choose the way we want to do it and I think yeah you know Grace you're absolutely right to mention the fact that we do cover all of these in the publishing book and um, it really does empower authors to kind of make the choice that's right for them and that particular book well, you know, Emma, it really is about power. And uh, the way uh, Sydney was mentioning power, one thing that's been wonderful, I think, over publishing, let's say, 50 years ago, where the author had no power, the author simply, you know, presented a manuscript, and they might not even recognize it when it comes out on the other side. I mean, I've certainly heard that in both the fiction and nonfiction space, that by the time it came to publication, authors... I, they didn't even know what the title was going to be. You know, th those kinds of things. Uh, the, the book Jaws, which undoubtedly has a fabulous title and cover. The author was absolutely no part of that decision whatsoever. That was a purely marketing publishing decision that was made. The author might have just seen it in a store and didn't even realize it was his book except for the name at the bottom. Um, and they made a great choice. But I think authors over time, whether they're indie or whether they're traditional, want more of that power. And mm -hmm. I think that that power starts with the decision first of, well, what route are you going to take? Mm -hmm. And what, even if you take a route that generally leaves you with less power, people do want decision making. Yeah, it's a great and, and point, think, Stephanie. It really yeah. is. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say because it's a double edged sword. You know, power is a double edged sword because <laughs> you have to live with the decisions you make, then, right? So yes. I remember very distinctly a conversation I had with my, my literary agent with Attention All Passengers. We had a meeting with, with HarperCollins, and the, the manuscript came back. My manuscript came back with a million edits. It was a 400 page book, and it's nonfiction, and, it, you know, we're I was attacking Fortune 100 companies and the United States government. So needless to <laughs> say, a lot of legal stuff, a lot of fact checking. And so there were millions of edits. And I, you know, I, I reached out to my agent at one point and said, you know, I'm not crazy about some of these edits, blah, blah, blah. Overall, I was very happy with it. But, you know, no, nobody's going to be 100 percent. And I remember him saying to me, you have to pick your fights, you know, and, and I think that was very valid advice, you know, whether it's the artwork 
whether it's the editing, whether it's the marketing, you have to, you cannot, nobody's going to win every fight. It's like politics or whatever. You have to compromise, you have to meet in the middle, you know, you give up something, you gain something, and you have to decide, well, this is the fight I'm going to go to the wall on. And suddenly now I'm self-publishing. Well, I don't have to answer to anybody in theory. Well, guess what? That's a double-edged sword because, you know, I could make some lousy decisions, right? So I sort of created a round table of people I trusted, some of them authors, some not artists, you know, whatever to say, what do you think of this? And what do you think of that? And, you know, and, and you're not always the best, the best, the best, you know, decision maker for your own work. That's a tough thing for <laughs> writers or artists to to acknowledge, but it's true, you know, so um, you, you know, each, I, I tried, I tried to stress in my chapter that, you know, each giveth and each taketh away, a thing, you know, I mean, um, you, you, there are advantages and disadvantages to both and you need to recognize those going in. Mm -hmm. and, and Bill, really I love to have a sounding board. Yeah, yeah, I love the image of the round table. Um, yeah. And I just saw Camelot, so I'm all about it. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, right. you know, that's one thing I say to a lot of authors when they come to me wanting to be published. Lately, one of my first questions is, who else has read this book? Right. And I want people, and I'm going to, I'm going to steal your round table image, to come as a unit because really it's so incredibly valuable if if people say to me well this is my baby nobody has looked at it i don't want anyone to see it and to, that's really not a good idea i think right. that we should definitely you know have our little round table have some advisors besides any professionals or publishing you might use other people soundboards people you yeah. trust that's a and, we talk, and we talk about that so much in Emma's book. We talk both about beta readers and also, yes. you know, various types of community. We talk about that as well in the marketing book. It's the closing chapter in the marketing book on the importance of networking and community. But most specifically here in uh, the book that Emma and I spearheaded, where we talk about the beta readers and the writing community as really sounding boards for our work as well as uh, Emma's work, which is as a book coach. Mm -hmm. So the editors and the developmental editors, so much has to happen as we talk about specifically in book one yeah. on uh, getting that book ready to move to publishing. Yay. Well, we've talked a little bit about power this evening. And mm -hmm. um, Stephanie, I loved your chapter. Your chapter was great. I learned a lot about the power of the dollar in this. And um, <laughs> I working out royalties, understanding royalties, which is again as an indie is something we need to be aware of and, and kind of understand. But one of the things that you emphasize in your chapter is that regardless of whether you're traditionally published or indie published or hybrid published, as soon as you hit publish, you are a business. You become a business. And I wonder, do you think many authors um realize that when they when they hit publish and they come all excited with this this baby that they've got and they want to put into the world. So you think they kind of appreciate how things change once you hit publish? Well, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that because they don't realize they're a business, but a month later, they, they do want to somehow get checks in the mail. Everyone is all excited when they get royalty checks, but they don't really understand the correlation behind how to make that amount better. And not just the royalty checks, because... One of the things I really wanted to harp in on in my chapter was that your royalty check is going to be a heck of a lot smaller than you think it is. You have no idea how much money Amazon is taking. I mean, really, uh, Jeff Bezos is not flying around in space just on his own money. It's your money. OK, <laughs> so it's really important for, for authors to realize that and also to, for authors to realize that as a business, your book is a wonderful asset that you can put out in a million different ways. You know, uh, uh, there's, there's a term called the seven streams of income. And honestly, every book can have multiple streams. We have one author that I think her Amazon sales have been about 11 books. She has probably sold 5,000 books out of the trunk of her car. She is just amazing the way she uh, she does a lot of speaking. She does a, she she get, grabs people in the grocery store. And by the time they get to the parking lot, they're buying a book. Um, when you have a book, 
there's a lot of different ways to sell that book. So if you just press the button and send it to Amazon, for one thing, your check will be very, very small. Um, but you're also wasting a lot of missed opportunities, whether your book is fiction or nonfiction. Um, you can be speaking, you could be running workshops, you could be literally selling out of the trunk of your car, or even selling online on your own website, as opposed to on Amazon's, where they're taking 50%, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's Amazon, Barnes and Noble, they are all taking about 50%. Um, so many of my authors are dying to be in a bookshop. Okay, when, by the time your book is in a bookstore, it's really just, you're doing it for vanity. If you want your book in a bookstore, do yourself a favor, take five copies, go to a bookstore and just hide them in the shelves. Because <laughs> that, that is honestly, if a bookstore sells your book, they are taking 55% of the profit before we even hit print costs. Um, we had a huge book selling over the weekend. And I mean, gobs and gobs of books were being sold because it was a, a celebrity book. And at one point, you know, we, we saw all the posts going up and how many people. And my husband turned to me and said, wow, how much are we making? I said, I think I could afford to buy you ice cream if you would like some, <laughs> really. Our, it's like this, <laughs> okay? So, you know, there are lots of different ways to sell that book. And I'm, I'm all about signing books in a bookstore. It's a lot of fun. But please do remember that your profit margin is practically nil at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I wanted to present people with not just the nuts and bolts, but the options. And it is a business. Emma, you're so right. Once you hit it and it's a business, please own it. Don't mm -hmm. just you know, think that you're going to, it's going to miraculously blossom overnight by itself. You can do a lot of things to make that business bloom even more. So it is exciting, but a lot of authors don't want to be business people. And that's kind of a little bit of a disconnect. They liked being writers. They yeah. didn't really want to be a CEO. Yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting, don't you think as well, because Bill was talking about how you know, the publisher had said, you're you're on your own there, guys. So even <laughs> if you do get that, there, there's still an element where re you have to be your own uh, yeah. PR person. You have to be your own um, biggest cheerleader in order to supplement the little that the, the publisher is giving you. you can't exactly. I'm so glad Bill said something on this that, that I think I'm going to write on a post-it over my computer about the third person versus the first person. You know, I mentioned my author who sold thousands of books out of the trunk of her car. I can't do that personally. I'm not a person who could walk around a grocery store and, and get you to buy this book by the time you get to the checkout line. Some people are. But the rest of us need agents or publicists or somebody else to tell the world about it. So, uh, you know, not all of us can toot our own horns. Maybe I should go with an Irish accent and I could pretend that I'm not the writer and then I could do it. <laughs> you or, or you can get your husband to do it for you. I, that's it. Maybe we could we could swap off and promote each other's books. I like that. You no, know, he can say, "Well, I don't know if she's available. I can check. I, I'll I'll get back to you. I'm not sure. Even when you're sitting right." <laughs> well, we, we are at the top of the hour, but if if anybody is willing just to stay on a few extra minutes, I did want to kind of bring in AI because it does seem to cover a lot of things, both with um the written word but then the, the audio word and of course the illustrations that go along with that and I was at the self-publishing formula conference last week and it was a big topic for discussion there everybody was kind of uh, interested in it um so Teresa you know narration um it feels like uh, that is possibly one of the places where um AI voices are going to come in quickest because I've heard you know even exact for example you could license Tom Hanks's voice, for example, and or, you know, he could or a publisher could, and then you get to hire uh, the AI version of his voice. I mean, do you see things going that far? It's hard for me to imagine an artist like Tom Hanks agreeing releasing his that. voice that way. Yeah, agreeing to that. But per perhaps posthumously, you know, mm -hmm. maybe there will be a way to gather together all of the clips of someone who's passed and say, their family might say, oh, what a wonderful gift that would be. And so, yeah, I think that what AI is capable of right now is just still in infancy in audio. Um, and I would say even in the last year, I've heard it get lot, lots and lots better. Um, 
And I think there will be a place for it, actually. I think there are um, audio versions of college textbooks that college students are listening to at 1.5 or 2.0 when they're really quick kids. Um, and maybe there will be a, a market for that. There will be a place where the human narrator is not as um, productive or economical, right? Like, I do think that the it's hard not to think about the bottom line, but anywhere that you're talking about a human story, one of those, you know, tell me a story. I just, it's hard for me to imagine that the human voice <clears throat> would be the right fit for that, I guess. But, but yeah, <laughs> it's definitely here. It is here. And I think there will be people experimenting with it. I think there will people be people in the technology space that get very excited about how it's going to grow and how they're training it. I think one of the things to be really careful about in the narrator space, um, and the union for narrators is the same union for writers, the sag after group, is, very, is being very cautious about how they're harvesting our voices, right? So mm -hmm. if you are going to contract with a narrator, make sure that you actually um, go through that contract with whatever large marketplace you're using. And um, that you respect the narrator because the author then is the audio rights holder. Once I give you my audio files, you own them as the author, the, the rights holder does. Um, and I think that in some places, um, there are technology wizards who are really excited about harvesting voices and training AI. And mm -hmm. so I would just be very cautious about that. For me personally, I would, I would rather not be training um, a computer. <laughs> <laughs> or with my voice, not that anybody's asking for it, but I've been watching my contracts carefully to make sure that there's not some collective agency. Um, and I think the same is true of all artists. I think the visual artist world is probably, in, you know, encountering the same thing is that we would like to see human art um, valued as, as art. I mean, really like, can we train computers to clean the toilets? I would rather do. Like, why do I need to train them to do art? Like, seriously. <laughs> Leave the human art to the humans and just train the computers to clean the toilets, please. I, agree. I, I love it. I'm right there. <laughs> Perfect answer, and, Teresa. Yeah. And Thank actually, you. Teresa, you make an interesting point talking about um, you know, how you're sort of really thoroughly reading your contracts to make sure that uh you're not agreeing to training AI um mm -hmm. with any of your recordings. That's something that the art world has not gotten around to yet. And that's why they, if you look on Instagram, there are a lot of protests going on on Instagram where people are sort of doing like the equivalent, like, you know, the blackouts that they did, things like that, where people are putting up the posts um, because so far there are no protections for visual artists um, because the minute that you put it online, it's accessible to anything. Um, so there are dozens and dozens of artists who just because they have an Instagram account now, all they all these AI programs now have access to everything that they have ever posted online. Um, and so now there's artists who are seeing, you know, other Instagram accounts posting something that looks like, oh man, I don't remember drawing this, but this sure as heck looks like something I would have done. And then they have then they realize, oh my gosh, somebody trained an AI on my work. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that a lot of us are, you know, trying to sort of it's hard. I personally don't know who the sort of authorities on that are going to be. I think it's probably gonna be up to a lot of the, you know, the tech platforms themselves like Instagram and Twitter, where I think a lot of people are petitioning them to, you know, when you create an account, you know, have some kind of, a, you know, permissions agreement to say like, I do not give, you know, permission to let my posts or whatever be used for AI training. But again, we, we don't have that yet. So I'm glad that at least in the audio realm, you're starting yeah. to see that. Um, because yeah. that's something that, uh, yeah, like I said, it's something that just a lot of other platforms are just not gotten around to yet. Mm -hmm. Um, it'll be interesting to see if people decide to use AI for illustrations. I can't imagine they would because the AI art that I've seen, while some of it is very impressive, um, I think the most successful uses of it that I've seen have been for generation of inspiration. So I actually saw some, uh, a 
this uh, costuming company <laughs> that was using AI to generate, you know, different ideas for different dresses. And then they go and they make the dresses themselves, you know, and that I think was much more successful. Whereas, you know, some of the art that I've seen where people are, you know, plugging in, oh, give me an illustration in this general sort of style of, you know, whatever content, there's always some kind of bizarre fluke <laughs> that goes on. I mean, I'm sure it'll get better, obviously, but it just, it lacks, I don't know, like you said, there's something about the human touch, you know, like you you mentioned earlier, Teresa, um, that when, you know, somebody's narrating, you can hear when they're smiling or not. Um, I, there's something similar in art that's a little bit harder to put your finger on, but I think it's kind of like that old, that old quote, you know, I, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't define it, but I know it when I see it. Mm -hmm. you know there's yeah. something yes, I think you I, I think you can that. hear it in the computer voices I think that's yes you can hear the human ear I think also um someone was explaining to me that you can the longer that you listen to an AI narration mm -hmm. um the more your brain hears the pattern of that yeah. and then it's hard to focus like they're actually doing exactly. studies on retention and comprehension and that if a computer is delivering it there is less intonation change. There is less, and the brain actually starts to kind of tune out that we don't hear it. We don't comprehend it the same way. Right. Um, but that is part of the training effect. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I think, it's, I think it's going to be really important to be authentic and transparent when something is AI in right. all art forms. I think it's gonna be important for authors to acknowledge <clears throat> when they've used it in some format for <clears throat> audiobooks, for. Don't, don't you agree? I mean, I think that that yeah, just the absolutely. transparency of it to set that as a an expectation. For and the way it's the way it's taken off, you know, Stephanie referenced earlier that some of these books, because we want them to be evergreen, will need to be, you know, rewritten in parts. And, uh, you know, part of it, the magic of publishing today, we can do that, take down files, put up new files, and, and that's all magic. But things like AI, you know, that's going to affect every single one of these books, Teresa, you're so wisely saying, you know, that the writers can do it. I, you know, I, I, I asked AI this weekend to outline me a 20 chapter book that I've been wrestling with. And I went, oh, so Sydney's idea of it's good for inspiration versus, you know, what are we actually doing? So, yeah, I think we all will have to um, watch this very carefully and keep our books and our work current and hopefully human. Um, yeah. throughout that. Uh, Emma, thank you for bringing that part up. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely going to be Wild West for a bit, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> Casey, who's watching us on the, um, the webinar, hi Casey, he's saying, I read AI Stealing Greg Rakowski's art. I don't know that author, but I can imagine that this is going to be a trend for a while, while everyone's excited about it, and then hopefully it'll calm down and yes. we'll figure it all out. Well, I won't keep anybody any longer. Thanks for staying that little bit extra over time. It's been wonderful meeting you all. Thank you so much for being part of this amazing collaboration of all of these three books and um, onwards and upwards. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thank you so much, Emma. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Emma. Great job. Thank you. Bye. Lovely.